There are costs associated with issuing a bond. These bonds are called issuance costs. In the past, the accounting treatment of issuance costs was different between IFRS and US GAAP, but now that has changed. Under both IFRS and US GAAP, companies initially report bonds as a liability on their balance sheet at the amount of the sales proceeds net of issuance costs. So the point now is that both standards have converged with respect to the treatment of issuance costs. Okay, now some general points. The effective interest rate does not change during the life of the bond. The point here is, let's say that you are the investor and I am the company, so I issue a bond. When I issued the bond, the interest rate was 10%, so essentially I issued a par value bond. Now after that, the rate in the market will keep changing, but as far as I am concerned, the company is concerned, I am going to record as if the rate is 10%. So I use the effective interest rate, which is what the market rate was when I <coughs> issued the bond. That doesn't change. Another point is that the book value of a bond rises for a discount bond and falls for a premium bond. And hopefully you saw this. If we look at a timeline, and let's say that this value here represents part, if I issue a discount bond, will I issue it at a price price of 100, more than 100, less than 100? It will be less than 100. Let's just say for simplicity that I issue the bond at 96. This is a discount bond. And this is a three-year bond. So what will happen over a three-year period? The value of the bond on my books, I being the company, will rise... 200. Why? Because I am amortizing and at the end of three years, what's my liability? It is 100. So on my books, I will slowly increase the value so that ultimately the payable is 100. What about a premium bond? So if a bond had been issued at 104, then what happens to the book value over the three years? Then it would decrease. Okay, now here is another point that some people get confused about. We just talked about amortizing the discount. Okay, so we use the term amortize. In the previous reading on long-lived assets, there we also used the term depreciation and amortization. So when we used amortize in the previous reading on long-lived assets, and when we use the term amortize over here, is it the same thing or is it different? There is actually a similarity. What is the similarity? A lot of people don't think about it, but I will help you through this. What do you do when you amortize or you depreciate? You have an asset, for example. Let's take a very simple example. Initial value of the asset is, say, 100. And you expect that after nine years, the value of the asset will be down to 10. So. If this is a, a tangible asset, you say depreciation. If it is an intangible asset, you say amortize. Let us just say that this is an intangible asset. What does amortization mean? It means that you are going through a process to reduce the book value down to 10, which is what you expect the book value to be ultimately. Now notice that this was done for, a, for, a, for an asset. What are we doing through amortization with a bond? In a sense, we are doing the same thing. If a bond was initially at 104, and after three years, the expected value is 100, through amortization, we are just adjusting the book value of that bond liability so that ultimately it is down to 100, which is what you expect the liability to be after three years. So in a sense, Amortization has the same meaning in both cases, on the asset side and the liability side. We are just making changes to the value on the books so that ultimately the value on the books rep represents what you expect the final liability to be. All right. And then finally, 
the effective interest rate method versus straight line method. I don't think this is overly testable, but everything that we've talked about so far is based on the effective interest rate method. So we have said that the effective interest rate is the rate that was in effect when the bond was issued. And then all our subsequent amortization and interest expense is calculated based on that effective interest rate. Now, another method for amortization would be a straight line method, which is allowed under US GAAP, where you say that, okay, the bond is initially at 104, I will bring the value down to 100 using a straight line method, just like we do with straight line depreciation. So recognize that this method exists and recognize that it would simply be a equal amortization over the period. With the effective interest rate method, the amortization is not equal. And you can see that from the examples that we have discussed. But if you are not told what method to use, the default in general is to use the effective interest rate method. I want you to do this question now. So the numbers you look at here, the coupon rate is 8.5%, which is more than the effective interest rate. And that is the rate which was in effect when the bond was issued. When this happens, then you have a premium bond. This is a very simple question, and it's the sort of question that you might expect on the exam. This other number, the market rate of interest today is 9%. That is irrelevant in the context of this question. OK, try this one now. So here is how you look at this problem. We have recognized that we have a premium bond. So it will be issued at a price above par. I have just picked some numbers here. It doesn't really matter, but it helps you solve a problem when you are working with simple numbers. Say 100 is the par value. Let's say that when the bond was issued, it was issued at a premium, say at 104. At the end of five years, the bond will be back down to par. That means that two years into the life of the bond, or any time actually between issuance and maturity, the book value will be above par. Our discussion so far has focused on reporting bonds at amortized cost. This method reflects the market rate at the time the bonds were issued. So let's take a bond where at time of issue, the market rate is less than the coupon rate. This would mean that the bond is issued at a premium relative to par, and over time, the book value of the bond will come down to par value. So this value over here is going to represent the amortized value or the amortized cost of the bond. If interest rates in the market change, then obviously the fair value will be different from the reported book value. Under the method that we've talked about so far, that fair value has no impact on what is shown on the financial statements of a company. However, under US GAAP and IFRS, companies now have the option to report financial liabilities at fair value. This means that if the fair value changes, then the book value can also change. And that would imply that we need to report either a gain or a loss. Now, if interest rates change such that the fair value comes down, then this means we have a reduction in liability and the reduction in liability represents a gain. On the other hand, if the fair value goes up, that means that we have an increase in liability and an increase in liability would represent a loss. We should recognize that there are two major reasons for why a bond's fair value might diverge from reported value. One has to do with simply changes in market rates. And the other is that the credit risk of the company that is issuing the bond changes. The way we deal with gains or losses that result from these two areas is different. If a bond value changes because of changes in market rates, then the gain or loss is reported in the profit and loss statement or the income statement. 
However, if the change in value is because of a change in credit risk, and this is the credit risk of the company that has issued the bond, then this gain or loss is reported in other comprehensive income. It does not flow through the income statement. Derecognition of debt. What does this mean? It's a fancy term, but effectively it means that a company has issued a bond. Now, when a company issues a bond, either the bond can remain issued and then at maturity the company pays off the par value. So that's one scenario. Or effectively the company can pay off the investor and retire the debt. So that's called redeeming the bond. And later on you will look at different ways of redeeming a bond. But essentially the company is paying off the investor before the bond matures. Once bonds are issued, a company may leave the bond outstanding until maturity or redeem the bond before maturity. When a company redeems the bond before maturity, there is a good chance that the amount of money that the company is paying to redeem the bond is different from the book value of the bond. How is that accounted for? There will be a gain or a loss. Obviously, if the company is paying more than the book value, then that should be a loss. If the company is paying less than the book value, then that would be a gain. Where will that gain or loss be shown? It will be shown on the income statement. But first, let's make sure we understand how to do the basic calculation. The gain is equal to the redemption price minus the book value of the liability at reacquisition date. So let's say that the redemption price is 1,020,000. The book value is this. Is this a gain or a loss? It is a loss because the amount that is being paid is more than the book value. So more cash is going out. So in this particular case, the loss is 30,000. The gain or loss from extinguishing debt is reported in the income statement in a separate line item where the amount is material. So if the amount is almost insignificant, then you don't need to show it as a separate line item. Dealing with bond issuance costs. Do you remember we talked earlier about the fact that when a bond is issued, there are going to be certain costs, issuance costs. What did US GAAP say? U.S. GAAP said that when you issue a bond, the issuance cost has to be capitalized and then amortized over the life of the bond. So if a bond has a five-year life and then after three years it has been redeemed, will there be some issuance cost on the balance sheet? Yes. It will be. So the unamortized bond issuance cost must be written off and then included as a gain or loss in the calculation. Obviously, it would be a loss if you are writing off the asset. What about IFRS? There is no write-off because the issuance cost is included in the book value of the bond liability. We are coming to the end of the segment on bonds. Debt covenants, again, we'll talk about these briefly here and then in more detail in fixed income. Debt covenants are restrictions on the issuer that protect the bond holder's interest. So if I am a company, I have issued a bond, obviously I have borrowed money from you. So there need to be some restrictions on me or some rules that, are, that I need to follow in order to make you comfortable, the investor comfortable. These restrictions reduce default risk, the risk of me, the company, defaulting and if the risk of me defaulting is less then that also reduces my interest cost because if my risk of default is lower then I can borrow money at a lower interest rate. When we talk about debt covenants very broadly speaking we can either have affirmative covenants or negative covenants and simplistically affirmative covenants are covenants where I the company or the issuer say that I will do so and so. So I will pay my coupon payments on time. I will make my payments. I will make, I will pay my taxes and so on. So 
all the places where the covenant says that the company will do so and so, they are called affirmative. The covenants where a company is saying that it will not do so and so, for example, a company will not issue new debt, those are examples of negative covenants. Now, both positive and negative covenants are there for the benefit of the investor. Technical default, this is a term used where one of the covenants has been violated. So, for example, a company says that it will not issue new debt, but it issues new debt. Even though the payments to the investor are being made, but one of the covenants has been violated. That is called a technical default. Presentation and disclosure of long-term debt, you can read this, but I will give you the basic points and most of this you know already. When you have long-term debt, the current portion of the long-term debt which is due within one year is shown under current liabilities. The rest is typically shown as a single line item on under non-current liabilities. And then if you look at the footnotes and disclosures, there will be a tremendous amount of information about all the long-term debt. And then you can also find additional information in the management discussion and analysis about a company's capital resources, which includes debt financing and off-balance sheet financing. Off-balance sheet financing is where a company raises money but doesn't show it on the balance sheet. And that happens through leases and specifically operating leases. That is what we will discuss next.